Well, it was really nice of you all to give me that round of applause, but I think you should also greet our guests, no. Lawrence and Richard. <laughs> They're here too. <laughs> they may not be as famous as I am, but I think they still deserve That's your true. We're respect nervous and about welcome. Being here with you. <laughs> all right, so let's dive in. Um, I'm hoping that at some point in what's going to be a free-ranging, freewheeling discussion of science and reason that will get to some things that you two might not see eye to eye about, but, but let's happen. start out with something that I think uh, you are on the same page about, um, and I have some questions about it. So <laughs> uh, one thing that I think is really apparent in, in the movie The Unbelievers, and also in your speeches and your writings, is this emotional reaction that you have, that you both have to science, um, the awe and the joy that you feel when you talk about scientific discovery and the scientific method and the scientific mindset uh, is quite apparent. Um, and, and I think that's interesting because it's not actually the default reaction that most people have. You know, when, when people learn about uh, the heat death of the universe <laughs> or uh, the fact that our life, our, our species existence was something of an accident and that there's no built-in purpose or meaning to life, um, often the reaction is less on excitement and more, you know, uh, depression. <laughs> so I, I, my first question is, I'm curious why you think you have the, this sort of positive reaction to the scientific view of the universe and, and human life. Um, it, well, you know, it's not, but it's, 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 it's the reaction we beat out of kids. All kids start out with that positive reaction to to the universe. It's, it's a joy in learning. We're, we're hardwired to want to learn and solve puzzles. And, and what happens is that that gets beaten out of people, I think, by teachers. And uh, uh, it's, so I don't think, I, I think we are, we are told that science is, is hard or boring and, and that we see that sometimes in, in role models. And, and um, instead, I think everyone Look at the people in this audience. Everyone really is excited by science. They, they, they don't just, they don't know what science they're excited by. They, they're told it's so difficult that they, that they can't enjoy it. And yet, we became scientists because we enjoyed it, right? That's why you became. Yes, I mean, the fact of your existence is the most astonishing fact. The fact that you're capable of apprehending the world, the fact that you're capable of doing all the mundane things that you, you were talking about, Julia, about how the, the normal reaction is just um, not to be particularly excited. It is astounding that we have in our heads machinery, computational machinery, which is capable of understanding why we're here, and a long way towards understanding why the universe is here and why the world is, is here. How could anybody not be absolutely riveted by the privilege that we enjoy of being placed in a world that we understand. For four billion years, life has been evolving, and, and finally now, just in the last few hundred years, few thousand years, a species has arisen which has a brain capable of understanding what it's all about. And we are it. How could you not be completely blown away by that astonishing discovery. How could anyone actually admit without shame to being bored? You know, it's really a shame though. Absolutely. That's the <laughs> right. But, but <laughs> I think that unfortunately, uh, and I don't know if it's the case in Belgium, but it's in, the, in my country, it's certainly the case that it's a badge of honor to be considered to be scientifically illiterate. It's something, not only is it acceptable, but it's kind of it's kind of a cultural badge of honor when you say, well, you know, I don't really understand that stuff. And we let people get away with it. It wasn't always that way. Shame on them, and it used to be in, in 100 years ago that they would be laughed out of the room if they didn't at least have a cocktail party knowledge of science while they talk about that, those other things. And again, the heat death of the universe, how could anyone not be thrilled by that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to say. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the scientific worldview I was talking about was less scientific discovery in general and more uh, the, the truly daunting scale of the universe and our relative insignificance in it. Makes you um, feel humble. Is what it I makes you feel humble, but it makes you feel, as Richard said, it has, should have the opposite effect. 
religion supposedly makes you feel good because you're the center of the universe, which is just silly. The fact that we are not the center of the universe, that we are insignificant, as I think I said in the movie, is, makes, in some sense, makes you feel more special. It's just such, such a fortunate accident that we're here, that, and we can, we can watch the whole thing happen. That, that uh, I, to me, it seems to me, we, we, our insignificance should breed more awe than the notion, this ridiculous notion that, that, that there's some, some divine being that cares about us. Mm. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know if you guys have seen this movie, Annie Hall, but uh, it's a Woody Allen movie, and in the beginning, young seven-year-old Woody Allen mm-hmm. has just learned about entropy, and now he's refusing oh, yeah. to do his homework because none of it matters. <laughs> Uh, and it, it is played for laughs, but I, I certainly know people who, you know, they're fine now, but when they were kids or adolescents and they learned about uh, entropy or... Is, or that, is that the place where somebody says, Brooklyn is not expanding? expanding yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Eat your... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I mean, so I'm talking more about um, the, the sort of dizzying realization that there, there is no built-in meaning or set of values in the universe that there's no uh, yeah you've got to have to courage life. to fit to face that yeah and, I'm, I'm and asking really about yes, that and you're asking about that you guys have oh, always well, had no, 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 this no, no. strength of it, it, i think resolve. everyone but you know i think like a lot of things people pretend that they're they're driven by that meaning that someone else imposes on them but ultimately the meaning you give your your own actions from even for the religious people i think matters more Ultimately, and that's what we need to teach people, is that, is that you, the, the, the only meaning is the meaning you give it, and, and, and it becomes more precious when, when you choose what matters than when someone else chooses what matters for you. I, you know, it's the pleasure of growing up. When you're a child, other people choose what matters for you, but the thrill of growing up is to choose for yourself, and, and a lot of people just haven't grown up yet. How do you know if you're choosing right, though? Well, it doesn't, you don't know until you... <laughs> but that's the thrill of being alive, is not knowing if you chose right. If it, if it was, if you knew it, it would be boring. You know, the possibility of making mistakes. And as a physicist, that, I'm, I do that professionally. And, uh, <laughs> and it's, it's a lot of fun. How much does that pay? <laughs> there is, I suppose, there is a, a certain fear of the cold unknown. The, 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 I mean, the universe almost entirely empty. This is a little oasis of life. There may be others, but... Um, but I think that's exhilarating. I think, I think the thought that you're looking out at a cold, dark, empty universe, and here we have this oasis of light and understanding and warmth and, and human affection and uh, all, all the things that make life worth living and the, the purposes, that, as Laurel says, the purposes we make for, for ourselves. Um, it's, there's something false about taking comfort in the face of that, from an illusion. Mm. And it, it's better to stand up tall and courageous and face the empty universe and make your own purposes. But, but Richard, when you, when, I know we've talked about this. Uh, you, it's not just empty. I mean, we get awe, when, we get awe, both of us, and I imagine most people in the audience, by looking up at the sky and seeing this vast, yeah, there, vast yeah. not just emptiness, mm-hmm. but it's full of amazing mm. things. The Hubble Space Telescope pictures are universally loved because people are amazed by the stuff that's out there. And the fact that it's so immense, it indeed confirms our insignificance, but I think it breeds a kind of awe and spiritual wonder that's far, as I often say, is far preferable to the, to the spirituality of religion because it's actually true. So. And it's big, it's not petty and yeah. small, and yes. And yeah, exactly. Yeah. Doesn't, you don't have to pray to it five times a day. Yeah. Uh, this is a slight tangent, but I'm wondering if either of you are worried by the apparent emptiness of the universe uh, in terms of what that might mean for whether our civilization has, the, has a good chance of, of progressing technologically enough to make it out into the stars. So this is the Fermi paradox um, some of you may be familiar with. Um, where, where is everybody? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, so where, where is everybody and, and if... Uh, if other civilizations have, have not made it to the point where they yeah. progressed enough to the, the, send the, out the main into reason the stars. For, for thinking there might be other civilizations um, is the, is the t- statistical one that the, that the universe is so mm-hmm. huge and the number of available planets is so huge. But by the same token, 
uh, it's so big and so spaced out that it would be entirely plausible that there might be as few as a billion other civilizations out there. As few as a billion. Because if it's as few as a billion, it's going to be so spaced out that um, we wouldn't expect to hear from them anyway. Yeah, I mean, so it, there's, it's, it's becoming, I just wrote a piece, it's becoming, I think, more, I'm more optimistic that there's life in the universe. Every day we learn about new planets, the, the new solar systems that we didn't think were possible. Uh, literally, we thought violated the laws of physics exist, and we re find out we have to rethink that. And we've learned over the last 40 years that life exists in these environments, which we also thought were impossible. So life is incredibly robust, and so the likelihood of life in the universe is very great. But, but uh, the fact that we haven't seen life, is, it's, if you think about it, it's, it's virtually impossible to find it if it's out there. It's, it's very difficult if you, as I often say, if you, um, even if, let's, our sun is only four and a half billion years old, and our universe is 13.8 billion years old. And so there could be civilizations that survive, that have been around for billions of years. I frankly think intelligent civilizations don't survive that long, but, that's, but let's say they are. They could have looked at the Earth since its formation four and a half billion years ago. If someone told them exactly where to look and said, look at that third rock from the sun right over there, then even then they would have only almost never found life on Earth because only during the last 50 to 75 years could they have listened to Star Trek or whatever. They, would our signals go out? So 50 years over, over for four and a half billion, you're talking of a chance of less than one in 500 million almost of finding life even on Earth if you knew exactly where to look. And we don't know where to look. And we don't even know what channel to tune to. So well, it's, it's hard. That's actually a little depressing because it, it, no, it makes it sound like uh, only a small minority of a civilization's entire history is spent in a technologically advanced age, which makes it sound like we're due to be ended soon. Well, I actually have written a paper about that a bunch of years ago. It turns out, well, it's a little, t well, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll give you 30 seconds of it. Um, it's an amazing fact that w our civilization right now works on Moore's Law, so that, so that my, uh, this has more computing power than the Apollo spacecraft did by far. So every, every year or so, the computing power of systems doubles. And that's something called Moore's Law. And it's been working for 40 years or so. But if you work out, it, it turns out to take energy to, when, to do a computation, or at least, at least erase the registers. And we worked out that if Moore's Law, if it continued for 250 years, it, doing computations at, at the, and improving at that rate, you'd use up the entire energy of the galaxy. Okay, in, in, in 250 years. So it's clear that advanced civilizations can't continue as ours has. And I think that's profound. To me, that was rather profound. It means mm. at some point they level off. And I ultimately think the solution of the Fermi paradox is that they, at some point, they decide they don't need to talk to us. I mean, ultimately, like, they turn inward would, and would they we say, we go know, out talking we, to pigs? We know, we know, they, they, we have nothing to learn. And so. Um, we'll just hang around here and, and stare at our navels or something like that. <laughs> anyway. Uh, I'd love to return for a minute to, uh, to, to the shift that happens when you replace a religious worldview with a secular scientific mm -hmm. worldview. Um, so I was asking before about this sort of sense of meaning that some people feel that they lose with that shift. Um, but I'm also interested in morality and values uh, and whether, you know, Yes, granted, uh, I know both of you believe that religion is not a particularly good source of a, a moral <laughs> system. I believe the word Richard has used is horrible. Uh, that was kind. That, that was, uh, <laughs> he was in a good mood that day. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but is there anything that you think can be justified in replacing religion as a source of morality I, I think other we, than our own sort of... I think we have to make our morality by intelligent design. Are you um, taking back that term? Keep taking back that I term. Um, we, we certainly are not going to get any help from religion. God forbid we should get, from, <laughs> get any, 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 any moral help, either from Scripture, which has a truly appalling moral lesson to teach, mm -hmm. or from just the sort of naive being good because you're scared of God, being yeah. good because you, you're scared you'll go to hell. That's, again, a, a very immoral way to get your morality. So we have to sit down together and design our own morality, which is what moral philosophers do. We have to sit down and decide what kind of society we want to live in. 
what kind of rules we need to live by. Things, I mean, expansions of the golden rule, mm -hmm. do as it would be done by. Um, make, our, make our morality fit our society in, a, in an intelligently designed way. And moral philosophers are doing a pretty good job of that. And I derive encouragement from the fact that as you look at history, there's a really rather rapid improvement in mm -hmm. our moral standards. We're, we're moving towards, um, moving away from slavery, moving away from various forms of appalling cruelty, not over the whole of the world, but over large parts of the world. And do you think that's roughly inevitable? It's, it, that well, it's, I don't know what, it's a bit like Moore's Law, which, which, which is true, but nobody knows quite why. Mm -hmm. um, if, you, if you look back to, not that long ago, if you just look back a few decades and listen to um, put, transport yourself in a time machine back to a, a typical dinner party a hundred years ago mm -hmm. and you would be hearing racism, you'd be hearing sexism, mm -hmm. um, women wouldn't have the vote, uh, there would be, um, you'd be utterly appalled by the sorts of things that people were saying. Decade by decade by decade, we're getting better. And I, but and I don't know what that is, it is like Moore's Law, which, it, which is a, an empirically um, demonstrable phenomenon, but nobody quite knows what's driving it and especially why it goes exponential. Right. Um, and the mechanism changes the every decade or so. Access, uh, you know, as you know, our friend Steve Pinker has written a wonderful book yeah. on, on, on the better angels of our nature. And, and uh, I think in there implicit in that book is the argument that, that rationality and the Enlightenment had a huge amount to do with it because you learn part of, you learn that, that the individuals who were slaves are the same as you. You, we, you learn empirical facts that increase empathy at some level, that pain, that, you know, that animals experience pain, and, 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 and you learn, so I think that, and you learn that, you know, ev that women are actually equal, and, uh, or, if you, you know, if you're married, you learn they're superior, but, um, uh, and by the way, speaking of that, I have to say one thing I disagree with you that I learned from my wife who I see over there, um, that uh, the golden rule is not a good rule. It's, if you think about it, do unto others, as, as you would have them do unto you is not the right thing. You should do unto others as they would have you do unto them. Mm. And it's a really different thing because, let, you know, the example I can think of is, let's say, well, I guess it's Belgium, I can say this. Um, <laughs> let's say, you know, you like to be spanked, okay? Speak for they, yourself. Yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> but, but, don't, but, don't, but if that's how I, let's say I wanted to be spanked, you wouldn't want me to treat you as no, I would. Indeed, I wouldn't. Exactly. No, no. Okay. We, we got here a lot faster than I okay. expected okay. we would. Just okay. saying no. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think if you generalize the golden rule, it, it completely uh, Yeah, works, I, like. I, I did say generalize the golden yeah, rule. Yeah, yeah, generalized yeah. version. Like, okay. like, I might want you to give me chocolate ice cream, and if your favorite mm. flavor is vanilla, then the rule is not I should give you yeah. chocolate, but I should give you the flavor of ice cream you well, like best. Yeah. yeah. But, That's but the how other, we save the golden rule. But the other thing that I think is we, we well, obviously, we both agree that we don't, and I don't think most people get their morality from the Bible anyway. The only ones who do are the ones who are full of hate, frankly. Mm. Uh, uh, I think most of us get our morality from from reason, and I asked in the, in the movie, there's a scene where I, I was speaking to an Islamic audience, and I asked, you know, would you kill your neighbor if he'd stopped believing God? And I was shocked, it's the only time I saw people put their hands up. But I don't really think they would. I think most people act the way they do because of uh, rational ideas about how they would, how, what kind of society they would want to live in. Moreover, I think we do everyone a disservice by saying loss of faith as if there's something lost. I think we've we got to replace that word. When we say lose face, it makes it seem like there's an emptiness inside of you, but there isn't. A faith-shaped hole. In the you, you know, you gain much more than you lose, and, 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 and you don't lose anything. And so I think, I think we should work on the language a little bit. I think it comes ultimately from, from rationality, but, but it's kind of filtered through the sort of social engines of conversation and journalism and and um, parliamentary discussions and um, it being morality jurisprudence yes mm -hmm. um, it, it comes ultimately from rationality but things like attitudes to to non-human animals um, attitudes to children attitudes to women um, the, these are in the air you, you you there's a climate of opinion which is sort of it's not literally hovering over the top of us like a ghost but it it's it's in the air in the sense that it's it's part of the, of the culture. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the, the decline of, of sexism, for example, mm -hmm. which is dramatic. Um, the way we treat homosexuals, dramatic change. 
um, gay marriage is now uh, accepted and commonplace, and, and it's not that long ago, 1960s, it was illegal in Britain. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I mean, you, you could be sent to prison for, for homosexual uh, activities. And you were. And you were. There were, th 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 there's, there's a shift in, the, in this zeitgeist, this, this ghost that's, that's, that's hovering around in, in the culture. And it's interesting to project where it's going to go next, I think. It's pretty hard to know, of course, mm. but, but it gives one hope. I, I, again, I've just written a piece where I hope it will come out next week in the New York Times, but, but that will, I, people say, and maybe this is one of your questions, I don't want to usurp it, but will, in fact, a journalist was just asking us today, do you think religion will ever go away? It's hard to know, but it's amazing how much can be done in a generation. Uh, there's there's a, you know, a statement that, you know, Theories never die, but physics die, and and uh, and so th that's how physics progresses because the old guys die and you move on. And I think, and I think the same is true. You're always only one generation away. And the example that Richard brought up is a, uh, I think, a really good one. In my country, again, gay marriage would have been, even a decade ago, would have been inconceivable. But if you look at any kid in the United States under 30, but even under 20, and I think mostly throughout the rest of the world, they don't even understand what the issue is. So it's the children. If, you, if we can just have one generation of children who are enlightened, then it's, it goes away. And, I, and, and part of what I think we're trying to do is encourage children to question. And once they do, I think even religion can go away. Well, that is actually a great segue into something I wanted to ask oh, okay. you both about, which is um, I, I certainly share your impression or, or conviction uh, that um, that removing religion from the world would have a bunch of good effects. Um, that said, there's some interesting research uh, pointing in the other direction, uh, maybe not wholly, but at least like, mm. uh, you know, a, a couple entries in the con column um, that are worth noting. So there have been a number of meta-analyses looking at dozens of studies, uh, looking for just correlations between degree of religiosity measured by various things like belief in God or attendance mm. at, at church, and, and various aspects of pro-social behavior. So sometimes that's um, uh, stated compassion for others, sometimes it's number of altruistic acts or uh, degree of empathy, um, uh, cooperativeness, uh, all the sorts of things that we think of as being valuable for society to run well and, and lead to human flourishing. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering... Well, well, look, there's one thing as a physicist that I really gotta point out, and I worry about this when people do epidemiological studies mm -hmm. and social studies, there's a difference between correlation and causation. Sure, sure. So the question but is, where's the chicken and egg? The pe are the people who are somehow more charitable and more cooperative, somehow because in our society religion is an outlet, they, they explore, or, or is it, and I, I, I think that's just as likely as, as the other way around. I, I absolutely agree. This is not a, yeah. not a, a proof but, at but, all. But, but, but imagine if it were switched. Imagine if the evidence showed that uh, religious people were more antisocial. Surely we would be holding that up as well, evidence, I'm right? Well, hold, I'll hold you up one. In my country, uh, th those states, the red states, uh, which are the ones where there, there's more, much more fundamentalism, as you probably know, the incidence of, in fact, uh, 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 unwanted children, the incidence of violent crime, those are much higher in those states. Almost all of those negative characteristics are, in, in, and so yeah, I guess you can choose what study you pick, but, but uh, it's rather interesting that those states that tout their religious morality the greatest tend to produce the most immorality. That's a, that's a fairly strong e effect. I mean, that's the work of Gregory Paul, yeah. um, who, did it, who did it not only on the states within the United States, he did it in uh, countries of Europe as well. And, and um, I mean, comparing, for example, the Scandinavian countries where there's great social welfare and ev ev everything is kind of cushy and the least religious countries in, in, in Europe. Um, it, it is a very strong effect. I, I haven't seen the meta-analysis you're talking about, Julia. I, I but, you know, I think, look, look, but at the same time, to, to, to defend you in some sense in that statement, there's no doubt that, I don't think either of us would argue that religion provides certain things for many people. A sense of community, in some cases, a sense of a motivation to a charity uh, and goodwill, at least at Christmas. I, and, uh, um, and, and, but I think, so that's fine. But the question is, is it necessary? Uh, could you find other less... Let more, better outlets? Could you mm -hmm. find ones that are more real? 
that might induce less violence. And so there, religion, look, religion wouldn't have been around in every society that's ever existed if it didn't have some, if it didn't have some effect that was at least positive in the sense of, of, of self-perpetuating. Right. Uh, but, I, the, but to me, the question is, fine, what are the things that it does provide, and can we mm-hmm. find better outlets for that? I would prefer every Sunday, instead of going to, to church to be... F- because the reason people go to church every Sunday, I think, is that the stories are so ridiculous that they have to be reinforced every single Sunday. To, <laughs> and, and so, so I... I uh, anyway. I've said, you know, quantum mechanics classes every Sunday would be so much better than, than, don't you think? We could sing songs about quantum mechanics. Yeah. I I think we we can't let this topic close without pointing out the totally obvious fact that it wouldn't matter if there was an absolutely cast iron case that that religion makes you better. It doesn't make it true. Yeah, that's right. And and as a scientist, that's the important point. I mean, that. Truth has got to come first, and if there are moral benefits as well, so much the better. So that is actually another thing I was wondering, whether, whether this, uh, the importance of getting rid of false beliefs um, in the case of religion, whether or not they're helpful or harmful, is something you would generalize overall, that, that all false beliefs in all domains, whether it's well, it, beliefs it, about my own, you know, well, we likability or about... Yeah, and I think you've heard me say, we all tend, except for Richard, most of us tend to believe 10 impossible things before breakfast in order to get up, as a, you know, you, you like your job or whatever. But, but I, think, I think the problem is that false, ultimately, false beliefs produce irrational behavior. And if, if you were an island and you didn't impact on other people, I wouldn't give a damn about it. But those, ira- those false beliefs produce irrational behavior, and you have one or one way or another control over others. If you're a parent, you have control over your children. A teacher, in some sense, you impact, or a politician. And we see what happens when you have irrational behavior. We can look. I mean, you know, look what it, it's just. It's just. It's just clear that irrational behavior is ultimately negative. And so, we. I think, it, on the whole, you might say, is it better to just let people be, you know, ignorant and bliss, or? or believe their false beliefs and feel happy. And I don't think either of us wants to make anyone unhappy. The question is, ultimately, if when they go out in the world and, and those false beliefs suddenly collide with reality, there's a great potential for unhappiness. And uh, that's my concern. And in fact, not only happiness for you, but the people you impact with. I, it's a little weird for me to be arguing on this side of the yeah. debate, because so often I'm, I'm arguing for the importance of, uh, of Unrooting and uh, and challenging your false beliefs, uh, but still there's this there's this element in the con column that uh, troubles me a little bit, which is there, in at least a you know s- sizable minority of cases there's a, a false belief that is clearly providing a benefit, like it is it is giving me comfort to believe that uh, oh that job that I lost well you know that was actually for the best that I lost it because of X Y Z or you know that that girl who dumped me well she snored anyway so you know actually I'm better off. Um, and I can see a clear benefit since, since, you know, in those cases, I'm assuming there's nothing you can do to change the situation for which it would be helpful to, you know, be able to face the truth. And, and I can, you know, it's hard for me to point to a clear benefit of, of trying to get people or, well, or I mean, encouraging I, I'm people a, to it's face... It's funny, I'm going to be a devil's advocate because I often say, you know, yeah, we all rationalize... I've lost track it, of what sides it, we're on, but... It, <laughs> it helps us get through life, but maybe... If you, if you realize that she dumped you because you snored, you should work on it because the next one will too. Oh no, she's, and, well, and, this and, imaginary girl. Yeah, I know, snored. I know, but <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, sometimes accepting reality makes you better for the next time around. It may be painful now, but it's tough love. You know, it's, it, so you're it not accepting it, my premise that there are some situations where you can't do anything with yeah. the, the painful I think truth. that there is something, quite, quite an interesting thought, that um, we, we might have evolved to be a little bit more optimistic than reality yeah. mm-hmm. would allow. Yeah. Um, and th- there's experimental evidence from, from psychologists that um, everybody, not everybody, but the majority of people think they're uh, more good looking than they are, <laughs> cleverer than they are. <laughs> and um, all the children are above average. And, all, um, all and, children and, above and average. Better, better drivers, goodness knows people <laughs> think that. Better drivers Ex- than they are. Except depressed people who have a realistic view they, of They have situation. a realistic view. This is true. Um, <laughs> And, and it, you, that you could make a kind of Darwinian case that you survive better in life if your view of life is a little bit rose-tinted mm-hmm. spectacles. Um, 
And, uh, but I, I wouldn't drag religion into that. I, mean, I think it's an interesting, it's an interesting idea that, that there's, a, there's a selective advantage to thinking that the glass is half full rather than half empty. But the point, yeah, well, but uh, you know, I, I, that's a good example. It's good to be optimistic unless, unless your optimism ultimately will, f will, will, will have you collide with reality and produce unhappiness. If so there's, it, a, yes. there's a careful balance. It, it's only a slight edge. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. and I mean the glass, is, yeah. if it's half full or half empty, it's your choice to call it with, but, but, but a half full glass isn't full, and to, yeah. to imagine it is yeah. is going to ultimately yeah. cause you problems. Uh, I think to play devil's advocate to my own devil's advocate, you, <laughs> could, you could make the case that uh, being in the habit of, of sort of practicing double think and trying to decide, well, should I fool myself in this case, or... You know, is, it, is, it, is there a benefit to me to trying to ignore the truth in this case is harmful to your overall ability to seek the truth? Well, look, you know, the other thing is there's a huge amount of evidence. As I keep saying, we, you know, we, are, we, we have a rational side, but we are not rash, just rational animals. And I think there's a lot of evidence now of studies that show that even when we make rational decisions, that, you know, we, reason doesn't necessarily rule over passion, that in fact our brain is... That, that there are emotional reasons that we end up making the rational decision to justify the decision we wanted to do. And I think we, we have to recognize we all do that as human beings and, 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 that, and just get on with it. Do you, do you see the potential for any kind of uh, second enlightenment where we actually improve our, our ability to be rational? Well, science, I, I think science is a huge part of that, right? I mean, science, the major benefit of science is to, get, is to second guess yourself. I mean, that's what science teaches us, is that A, that it's okay to be wrong, and B, that you often want something, and therefore you convince yourself of something that isn't true. And, and when we produce science, we, we get used to asking, are we, is this really happening or is it we want it to happen? And that's one of the reasons why I think it's such an important thing to try and convey to people, mm -hmm. not just the facts of the amazing universe, but the process of opening your mind up to the possibility that you're wrong. And that's, to me, the best, great, one of the greatest benefits of science. It, it is true that, 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 that science has its own built-in discipline, its own built-in police system, really, to make sure you're not deceiving yourself. Mm -hmm. And this is fairly recent, I think. I mean, medical researchers now are scrupulous about mm -hmm. doing double-blind trials because, it, because we've realized that it's so easy to, 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 to want a particular result so, so much that you totally innocently, without meaning to. You bias your, your observations, you bias all sorts of things. It's got to be done in a blind way, and this is all part of the self-policing that science imposes, which I think nothing else really does. Yeah, um, and you, I mean, and it's still, as a scientist, you constantly have to, to train yourself, and, and, um, and, and, uh, it's very, and in experimental science, there's many, many examples of people finding we all, want to, we all want to believe. We all, as, as Fox Muldar would say in the X-Files, we all want to believe. And I think it's really important to realize that. And, and, um, and R Richard Feynman, who is a, someone who is a physicist, of course, is a hero, and I wrote a book about him. But he used to try and reinforce that all the time by, by going around to people and saying, um, you won't believe what happened to me today. You just, you just won't believe what happened to me today. What? And people say, what? And he'd say, absolutely nothing. <laughs> and, and because we all assume significance to things that are completely accidental and not significant. And, and uh, the greatest example is dreams. People dream nonsense dreams most of their lives, but one day they have a dream that happens to so their friend breaks their leg and then they wake up the next day and their friend breaks their arm and they go, cosmic, you know? And, and uh, anyway. But, but so you're describing mechanisms in science that keep science not completely honest, but, you know, honester than it could be or honester than it was. Um, and I think, unfortunately, the human brain is just really good at compartmentalizing. And a scientist who's very scrupulous about uh, randomization and, and blinding and, you know, n not mining data in the lab will come home and, you know, cherry pick examples of when his wife, you know, didn't do the dishes and mm -hmm. ignore the cases when he didn't do the dishes, mm -hmm. etc. Uh, so I'm, I'd be curious well, if you guys have any... Uh, if, if you find yourself um, using any of these principles of, of scientific thinking and objectivity in your, in your regular lives, you know, when you're not doing science, maybe you could <laughs> share with us. <laughs> well, I, I, there are many examples of the opposite. I, I mean, we, <laughs> you know, scientists, believe it or not, are human. And, uh, 
And Good so, thing I was sitting down yeah, for that yeah, one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's a, a surprise to many people. And so, of course, we all, I, 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 I like to think that, um, that, that I'm able to, more able to, to try and ask, what, second guess what I'm doing. But I'm fully aware that like anyone else, I, I do exactly that. We, I, I, you feel better. And it's easy to want to do the things that make you feel better. But, um, and it's sort of interesting, isn't it, that, that uh, somebody who is too clinically scientific in their personal life, people don't like them very much. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's <laughs> what, that's who's the character in Star Trek who, uh, um, who has no emotion? And, um, Spock. Spock? Yeah, Spock. <laughs> He's um, not human, so it's okay. Yes. <laughs> but, but, but sometimes real humans are compared to Spock. You know, it's funny, because all my favorite characters in Star Trek are always the ones who, who like Data and Spock, the... the, the, the um, the non-emotional. I've non never actually ones. seen Star Trek. So I know. Don't tell him. I keep. I hope I no keep one telling, brought rotten tomatoes. I keep telling Richard he shouldn't admit his cultural. Yeah. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Okay. Have you guys heard of the Straw Vulcan? It, it, it's an archetype. It's a, a play on the Straw Man, which is like a weakened caricature of an argument. And the Straw Vulcan is a weakened caricature of rationality or science. Oh, okay. Um, no, 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 no. So the Straw Vulcan is the one going yeah. around, you know. Uh, uh, sniffing at people for, for falling in love or, or appreciating beauty or having fun. But you know, that's the, unfortunately though, that's, that's a stereotype. Again, I think it's, it's really important that we convey scientists as, as people and sometimes sexy people. And, uh, and I work on, no, anyway. Um, but, uh, but I think it's really important. And, and I, you know, I was on a, uh, uh, once on the Sundance, there's a festival called the Sundance Film Festival and I was on a, uh, I was a judge there one year because it's a competition of trying to not have movies about science, but have movies with scientists in them because scientists mm -hmm. are indeed stereotyped as being non-emotional, non-romantic, non the rest. And I don't even mind, as many of my colleagues hate, but I don't even mind the Big Bang Theory. I happen to like it. And, and I've been there and, and at the set of it. And because I think those characters, are, even though they are stereotypes, in some ways they actually are very likable and emotional and and you come, as you come to know them over time, you find out that, they, that they're likable. And, and so it, whether or not, I mean, and it's important that we convey all aspects of science instead of the stereotype, white jacket, non-emotional scientist, because science is full of emotion. Now, the, the, the results of science aren't full of emotion, but the practice of science is full of emotion mm -hmm. for both of us and all scientists. Scientists become scientists because it's fun, or they enjoy it at least. They certainly wouldn't do it if they didn't. It's, so it's a, there's a great deal of emotion in it. Mm. <laughs> see? see, Richard agrees. Richard agrees with me. See, <laughs> one excellent argument undermined in a single. Mm. Yeah. No, no, he agrees with no, me. No, I agree too. Totally. Yeah, yeah, there we go. <laughs> totally and utterly. Yeah. Well, there's a scene in the movie where Richard says it, um, but Carl Sagan, in in uh, in that in that. Um, oh, when you're in love. Um, you want to tell the world. Yeah. Uh, yes. And when you're in love, you want to tell the world. If you're in love with science, right, uh, right. how yeah. could you not, or something like that? Yeah. yeah. Right. Mm. Uh, well, sort of relatedly, um, one of my, cons I feel like I'm only just bringing up concerns about science and reason, but just know that I'm, you know, 99% on its you, side. You've been asked to be devil's advocate. Uh, yeah, just yeah, know that, right. please. Um, so I, I have a friend who refers to skepticism um, as sort of the, the community uh, of skeptics um, as... Uh, being subject to something he calls the cowpox of doubt. Um, and basically the idea is that um, as a skeptic, and I would imagine as a, an advocate for atheism, um, you spend so much time going around uh, pointing out ridiculous false beliefs that other people have that that can, he was hypothesizing, kind of inoculate you against noticing your own false beliefs because you get used to, to thinking of false beliefs as these obviously ridiculous things. Well, and of course, you don't see any obvious ridiculous things in your own belief set. Well, first of all, in Richard's defense, <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think, in spite of what people, in spite of what the press say, I think if you look at what we both talk about, and Richard, look at the books that, that, that we were signing today. We spend much more time talking about the wonder of reality than, talk, than trying to find false beliefs. We, I mean, of course, the, we're talking about the wonder of reality point inevitably shows those false beliefs are wrong, but I don't think, I don't even think you are an, I, would, would you call yourself an advocate for atheism or would you just call yourself an advocate for reality? Yeah, re reality, that's what yeah, I'm saying. I think but I, I'm, I'm, 
I don't think we've picked up on the cowpox point, but which I, I didn't quite get. I mean, the thing about cowpox is that it immunizes you against smallpox. Right. And so what, you, what your friend is saying is that we are... Immune to... Because, because we're so used to talking about ridiculous things like homeopathy and religion, um, we are therefore somehow blinded to the smallpox, which is... Which I wonder what he's thinking of as being... Well, so you're, 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 small pox. your own beliefs, he, he's saying your own beliefs, you're not willing to question them because you, is that, is that sort of the idea? Yeah, yeah, yeah so um, you, you know, you, you get used to always being on the clear side of, of correct beliefs and you, you know, don't spend as much time wondering if what you believe is, yeah. is I, actually I'm, true. I'm struggling to to make the analogy into a good one. <laughs> it's, it's, um, it, it's, I'll pass that on. No, no, but uh, I think there's, a, there's another reason that we, we, are, we are inoculated. Uh, because we happen to have a public voice, both of us, mm -hmm. it's really easy to find out when you're wrong. Because you just have to say something, and you get a gazillion tweets. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and so it's, it's, there's a lot of feedback. And, and in fact, you, you have to be very... I've learned, and I assume you've learned, that, it's, that you can say things off the cuff when you're in a dinner party. But when you're in public, or if you write it in a book, mm. you have to be much more careful, because people will, will immediately jump on it. And uh, that's a good thing, I think. But, but so I think... That, that helps, um, has helped me uh, be very, I, I actually sometimes hold my tongue. It may not seem like it, but uh, to think to about, yeah, it's hard that, to imagine, yeah. isn't it? Anyway. Uh, do you find it at all difficult to acknowledge when you got something wrong or when, when some... You know, I love being, well, I no, as I, I often I, say, as a yeah. physicist, that, you know, the best thing, situation to be in if you're a physicist is wrong or confused. And I'm both all the time. I just <laughs> think it's the best thing in the world. That's great. Because being wrong means you've learned something. There's something new about the world. And being confused means also there's something to learn. So, yeah, I have no problem being wrong. And, or, in particular, more important, and I think this is a problem that parents and teachers have, I have no problem not knowing. And I think mm. more parents and more teachers should say, you know, I don't know. And because that's, that's uh, the impression that kids get is that, they're, that, that they're, everything is known is a, is a good reason for them not to want to learn anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. See, <laughs> Richard's very talkative. <laughs> okay. um, well, I, I've told anecdotes about two teachers of mine, which I've printed them, so I probably won't re repeat them. And one, one, one of them um, saying, I don't know, in a, in a very... Have everybody heard this anecdote, or shall I... Um, tell it. Okay, I'll, I'll tell this, and I apologize to people who've read it. Um, uh, we were having a biology lesson at school, and we were talking about hydra, which is a little um, freshwater creature. And our teacher, Mr. Thomas, said, what animal eats hydra? And he pointed to the first boy. Mm. What animal eats hydra? And the boy guessed. And then the next one, what animal eats hydra? What? He went all the way around. No, what animal eats hydra? And, and, and went all the way around. And then he got us all eager to know. So we were all going, sir, 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 what animal does eat hydra? And then he stopped. It was dead silence. And then he said, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. And I don't think Mr. Coulson knows either. Mr. Coulson, Mr. Coulson. <laughs> and he, he rushed into the next door room, <laughs> opened the door, dragged his senior colleague out, <laughs> who was looking a bit bewildered. <laughs> um, Mr. Coulson, do you know what animal eats hydra? And Mr. Coulson fortunately had the sense to say, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. um, and um, we none of us have forgotten that, yeah. that lesson, that, 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 that you say, I don't know, and it's a virtue because then you, you want to find out. And the, the other anecdote, which I've also published, is of uh, a sort of elder statesman figure in the Department of Zoology at Oxford, John R. Baker, who um, had spent much of his life um, propounding his theory that the so-called Golgi apparatus, which is in all mm -hmm. cells, um, was actually an artifact. It wasn't, wasn't really there. And finally, a visiting researcher came from America and gave a research talk in the department, showing lots of slides, proving beyond any doubt that the Golgi apparatus is real. It's not an artifact. And John Baker stood up, wa marched to the front, shook his hand and said, my dear fellow, I wish to thank you. I've been wrong these 15 years. And that aroused the most tremendous cheer yeah. 
uh, from the audience. Whereas in a political context, being wrong is not, you, you, you try not to admit it. If you're, if you're wrong, the opposition shout, resign, resign, and yes. things like that. that was so in, 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 in science, it's okay not to know, and it's okay to be wrong. At least we pay lip service to that. In practice, uh, sometimes if you have indeed spent your whole life propounding something, you were quoting Max Planck earlier, yeah. Lawrence, Science proceeds funeral by funeral. I mean, that's the, that's the negative. The yeah, field. no, it's very hard. But I think, uh, um, I think uh, it's what we should be teaching. Look, and I think I said in the movie that really, the, in physics anyway, the only way people learn is by seeing, confronting their own misconceptions. You can tell them something, but it just, it's not the same as if they see for themselves that they were wrong. That's, what, that's one of the reasons why you often use science fiction. And, in teaching physics, because it's such a storehouse of things that are wrong. And, uh, and, and it's great, because you grow up thinking these things, and suddenly you say, wow, th that's wrong. And, it, and then you remember it. You'd never remember it if it's mm -hmm. just written on the blackboard. Mm -hmm. So have either of you convinced the other one that he was wrong about something? I <laughs> don't think we've really tried it. I mean, because we, we're we, in different fields, and yeah. so and so. No, no, but I think well. Uh, I, I mean, mm -hmm. politics, religion, well, we strategy. First began, we first met by me. Uh, you know, I think you've told that story about about uh, the first time we met. I argued that Richard was wrong about something, um, and now did, I've. Did you convince him? No, I think we've come to a mutual. I think we. I like to think we both moved a little bit in in in, yeah. in the. In the, in the direction. Today. I've actually just been writing about that in my autobiography. <laughs> I can't wait to read it. And, and I said we'll something like... see if the story like, is the same as the way Lawrence I tells said it. something like, um, uh, a, a, a man stood up in the, in the audience, um, not particularly tall, but every, <laughs> but every inch a confident one, or something <laughs> like that. Um, and um, I was bowled over by Lawrence's fluency and... Um, this was an un unusual coming from an, from an audience question, and then we had a we had a drink afterwards. I mean, he was criticising me for um, being too aggressive towards religious people, uh, and um, because it wasn't nice or it wasn't strategic or it wasn't not strategic. not strategically yeah. um, not po not politic, mm -hmm. um, because you don't con you don't convince people by telling them they're idiots, mm -hmm. um, and. W that, of course, is true, although I, I myself in the movie we talk have about been convinced yeah. by being told I was an idiot. And, and I, uh, you know, and I argued strategically, yeah, you've got to, I've always said, you've got to, teaching is seduction. You've got to go to where people are mm -hmm. and try. But, you know, at the same time as having said that, you, you get woken up. And I, you know, so I think there, it, uh, it, it, a thousand points of light. It takes, it takes all different approaches. And sometimes kicking, you know, someone in the head is the only approach you can have. And I, and I think so, so there are many times, the greatest example I can think of where, where Richard sort of convinced me I was an idiot, in the sense he wasn't talking to me necessarily, but I was in the audience. And I suddenly thought, oh yeah, you know, I bought that garbage all along. It's a wonderful example of yours about that, that newspaper, I've told you about it, where there's a, at Christmas time, there's a picture of these oh, kids, yeah, yeah, and yeah. it's like, um, um, you know, these little kids, and they're all happily playing together, and it's like, they say, this is a Muslim kid, this is a Jewish kid, this is a Christian kid, mm -hmm. you know, this is a Buddhist kid, and you go, oh, isn't that sweet? And then you think, what the heck? What if we said this is a neoliberal kid, this is a socialist kid? I mean, <laughs> these are three- or four-year-old kids. How dare we label them? And I n it never hit me. And I, that and didn't hit me either. As I was listening, I was like, what's no, the, that, what's the that's catch going to be? That's one of my main... I mean, I, I use the phrase consciousness raising because, yeah. which is which is a which is a feminist phrase, and and feminists have you have raised our consciousness about things like one man one vote, mm -hmm. um, and I think that we are in the business of consciousness raising. We're not trying to dictate to people yeah. what they should do, but something like saying, "This four-year-old child is is a postmodernist child. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this four-year-old child is a neo Gramscian Marxist child." <laughs> um, <laughs> um, you just don't do that, and yet we all don't bat an eyelid when people talk about a Catholic child or a Protestant child or a Muslim child. And you have no more right to call them a Catholic child or a Muslim child than you have to call them a, a, an existentialist child. So that, you know, that's I want to meet that child. Yeah. But this that's is a, a great <laughs> example of sort of 
he wasn't trying to seduce me. He was trying to, I mean, or me, the audience he was talking to me. He's pointing an example of, again, confronting your own misconceptions. And, and then you suddenly realize how silly they are. And so sometimes I think it takes what may seem harsh, although I, I was again saying to a reporter today, it's, <laughs> Richard gets a, uh, also a, I, I think I was presuming more about the Richard's approach to things because I, I bought into the claim that he was strident. But having mm -hmm. spent a lot of time and also now having been called strident myself, yeah. I see that, that you know, it's, there's, it's, not, it's not particularly strident. There's not, it's just it's this rap you get. And uh, in our society, the minute you question, um, I said it in the movie, I think, the minute you, the minute you just begin to ask questions, uh, but if you ask anything about questions about anything else, you're admired, but the minute you ask questions about religion or God, you're called strident. What, and you're shoving you do things down other people's throats. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. it's like it's that wonderful quote of Ricky Gervais where it says, you know, uh, uh, keep quiet about your atheism, you know, and, and it's, it's it, at the end of the movie. It's like everyone has a right to think what they want, but keep quiet about your atheism. Yeah. Anyway. Do you think, um, never mind about religion, do you think that there's something threatening about clarity? I think there are some people who are somehow feel warm and cozy if they get a lot of obscurantist sort of twaddle. But if they, I mean, in, in a way, that was the problem with, uh, I said, when you stood up in the audience mm -hmm. and, and it was, the, it was the fluent clarity of it which, which came across as being aggressive, and it probably wasn't aggressive. Oh, that's interesting. Um, and actually, Neil deGrasse Tyson attacked me in similar terms in the identical place in San Diego. Actually, in San Diego. In the, in the same... Uh, actually, when I, cr I criticized you earlier, San Diego, we, 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 we already discussed it, but doesn't oh, was matter. that right? Yeah. Where was yeah. the first time then? It was uh, actually at that, an event in, in near Canada? Buffalo at that dedication for okay, the Okay, I must get that right. Great example book. of showing Richard he's wrong yeah, and okay. having him. But Neil, About Neil, trivial things. <laughs> Neil yeah. Tyson, um, uh, I, I just had an argument with Joan Roughgarden, yeah. mm -hmm. um, who has, who, who'd become religious, or, or become rather vocally re religious, and um, I'd had an argument with her, and Neil Tyson stood up and said, Something about the, the 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 fierce clarity of what I was saying was being was 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 cruel or something like you know, forget his exact words. It's it's quite a popular thing on mm -hmm. YouTube. Um, if you Google um, YouTube Tyson Dawkins, you you get it. <laughs> um, and he it has he was really. All your I mean, the the interesting thing is that 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 his intervention was about as clear and fluent <laughs> as anything I've ever heard. And so and so. Um, but I mean, it, 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 that which is interesting in itself, um, and that that was the time when I said I gratefully accept the rebuke, and then told the story about science is interesting, and if you don't agree, you can fuck off. That, that <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I guess there's a reason that governments are infamous for using obscurantist language to talk about their their policies or yes. their views. It's you know yes. so much gentler and well, more yeah. Sinister. Well, I mean, it's really. It is amazing to listen to um, a conversation where people are just, you yeah, know, the purpose is to diffuse and to uh, obfuscate. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah. and, and politics is largely that. And it's un unfortunately, it's, uh, ba you know, I don't see a big difference between ideology and religion. Mm -hmm. um, it, 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 well, yeah, I don't. I was gonna, the ideology produces violence too. And ideology is basically the idea, like religion, that you know the answer before you ask the question and that you know what's right before you even discuss it. Mm -hmm. And once you know what's right, the purpose to, then what you do in any discussion is try and, and, and twist things around to that. And, and the same thing we both debate with theologians and others. And it's just amusing to see the, the, the epicycles with an episode. I mean, I'm not talking about the really ridiculous ones like some of the ones you saw in the movie. There are some quote unquote refined theologians who are, much, and, it's, and they're very bright. Um, not like the Archbishop of Sydney is a moron, but, uh, uh, <laughs> But they're, they're, But how they're, do you really feel, Lawrence? Yeah, well, you know. <laughs> but, uh, well, you just have to watch them. But uh, they're, these guys are very bright, and what they're bright at is producing these, epi these incredibly complex yeah. arguments to get to nonsense. Yes. And it's really amazing. <laughs> it's really so have either of you, do you feel like you've learned anything about how to persuade people? I mean, I, I imagine it's rare to actually change someone's mind about religion, but I know it well, happens sometimes. Well, I think, have you I think it ha I'm ha pleased to say, I know I've been many times in the ritual where people come up and say, you know, the God delusion changed my mind, and, and I'm happy, and it this, and to some, that happens to me too. It's really, it, it's really uh, gratifying not to know that you've changed your mind, that you've had an impact on someone mm -hmm. in a positive way, but it, 
I think it happens, and it happens a lot. And the same thing happens, one of the interactions, the nicest things about this movie is people have come up and, or written and said, you know, I've learned that, I'm not a, that there are a lot of people who feel this way, and I'm not a bad person, in spite of the fact of what my neighbors or my parents or whatever tell me. And so I think, I think it is possible to change people's minds. That's not what we do, as we were saying to that journalist say. It's not what we do when we debate. We're not trying to change, Richard wasn't trying to change the mind of that archbishop, but presumably what he was trying to do was the audience members who may not be so entrenched uh, get them thinking about it, right? That's right, right. there's a third party uh, listening in, yeah. But I mean, I mean is, it, is it the, the presentation of your arguments or is it uh, uh, showing people that atheists, uh, you know, don't actually eat babies or is oh, it the, the, mocking? It's both of or? those. I mean, the, we, we've got a, cam my, my American foundation is running a campaign called Openly Secular, mm -hmm. part of which is to try to get a whole lot of people, a bit like the, f the cameos in, in the mm -hmm. film in The Un Unbelievers, getting people to, to make just sort of one minute YouTube films saying, I'm an ordinary person, I'm a bus driver, I'm a waiter, I'm a, I'm a, a c crossing sweeper, um, I'm a lawyer, uh, and, I, and I'm an atheist. And just because in America, um, the popular perception is atheists have two horns and a tail. And, and so... Um, well, we talk about in the movie, I mean, that, that yes. it's, it's that this amazing studies that show that atheists are distrusted more than any other group other yes. than rapists. Except rapists. Yeah. Right. But also you, you need argument, you need rationality. But I want to pursue that th the thing about clarity because I'm interested in this. Mm. When, when you're in an audience, when you, when you have somebody asking a question from an, from an audience, and m most people are quite hesitant and quite nervous, and mm -hmm. so there's a fair bit of sort of stammering and stuttering and rep repetition and things. If somebody stands up from the back and in a loud, clear voice, declaiming total clarity, fluency, as though he's reading it, he's not reading it, but it's, it's as though it's sort of coming straight out of his head, there's something a little bit threatening about, about that clarity, and there shouldn't be. Um, but am I completely wrong about that? It's interesting. Well, I, I guess mean, one sort of look, well, I think we who the hell does he think he is? You know, it's, <laughs> sort of, um, it's interesting. I guess, you know, I think we are trained with these social mores that you're not supposed to be too honest. That, yeah. you know, you're supposed to be, that even if you think someone's, an, you know, being an idiot, you, you, you don't necessarily say it all the time, and sometimes you do, but, but or, or, or disagree, or, uh, I mean, you don't want to embarrass people, I think, and so I think, I think there's these social arguments for why in, in common, I mean, in a, in a lecture, that I think it's appropriate, but in a dinner party, you probably wouldn't, I don't know, have you no, done it at dinner no, parties? No, that's right, you, you, at, at a dinner party, you wouldn't wish to come across as being too... Uh, or embarrass too your much host of or someone know else. All, yes. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So I think there's, I think that's a social, mm. social thing. Yeah, I think if you look at the way people of, uh, you know, higher in a social hierarchy, traditionally talk to people lower in a social hierarchy, it's much more simple and direct. But the way you talk up to someone above you is with lots of flowery, yeah. you know, language and Phillips and uh, mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and honorifics, and that's sort of how you show respect. Yeah. So there might be some echoes of that. Yes, I think as so. As well. Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> Fun mystery. Yeah. Um, let's change tax a little bit. Um, there's a. I keep thinking about what are the what are the hurdles to um, not even science science literacy, but science appreciation and you know general positive feeling towards science. Um, well, I was actually going to give my own answer, but I'll yeah, stop do, myself let's, first. Yeah, do. do oh, okay. We'll hear you for change. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I don't think this is the main one. Um, but one thing that I've been, I've been wondering if it plays a role is uh, the fact that, you know, there's this distinction between really established science, mm -hmm. like gravity and evolution, mm -hmm. and then science referring to new papers that are published, you know, each, mm -hmm. each week in various scientific journals. And I don't know if this is true of physics, but for at least most scientific fields, uh, there's just a significant minority and maybe even a majority of papers are wrong in some way, and sure. they fail to replicate if, if you, anyone even tries to replicate them. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can, you know, quote a nutrition study about how coffee is good for you, and then the next week it turns out that's wrong. And so I wonder how much of people's distrust of science is just, uh, you know, n not making that distinction between... I, I think you're right that people don't realize at the forefront of science, I I there's a lot of speculation and there's a lot of garbage. And, but the neat thing is that the, there's a process for filtering that out, and that's what we don't teach. We teach a set of facts, and I think a lot, of, a lot of the problem goes to journalists, actually, because they love to report this study, 
and then they don't explain then then when another study contradicts it they don't they don't ever go back and say you know right. now now we, look we've tested this idea so this week this is true that week that's true and it's never and and that I think is a I agree with you is a real problem because people get the idea that there's no constancy that everything we think today will be proved to be wrong tomorrow and and that but the important thing is that it can be proved to be wrong right. yeah. that, that 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 there um, is a process but I think there is I think Julia's right that that there's a distinction between say big physics where when something's wrong you know that somebody's going to repeat the experiment and and um it'll if somebody says that there's particles traveling faster than light then dozens of physicists all over the world are going to be beavering away mm -hmm. testing that but in medical science and nutritional science as you say there's just so much complexity going on so many different studies going on so many variables influencing the the point of interest that it's hardly surprising that you get contradictory results and there's just too many of them to, to replicate people aren't going to I mean many of the studies in my own field of animal behavior um, you, you pretty much know nobody's ever going to repeat the, the the experiment it's just there are so many experiments you could be doing so many different animals so many different things the really controversial results get repeated yeah that's the point the really if it's interesting enough to, to be significant yeah there's a lot of garbage you won't repeat because you, you as Feynman used to say again I have a certain amount of time and so I'm not gonna you know when I've, I've used to debate UFO people right mm -hmm. and they'd always say if you do you know do you know do you know about this episode 1946 where so and so and if you haven't studied that how can you yeah, say yeah. And you say well look you know it, I have a certain amount of time and given the likelihood that it's right I'd rather spend my time on other things that's right but yeah. the controversial stuff I think gets does get addressed and uh, gets addressed relatively quickly but even even then it may take time but the pro you're, you hit your point I think the medicine and biology are just much that's the reason I do physics. It's just yeah. much easier. <laughs> it's it, it, it's, it, it, it's, it's much easier to do experiments. It's but, but it's the hard science. I don't. But, well, but it's it's the hard. I don't know why they call it the hard science yes. because. But it literally is easy in the sense that it's well. It's easier to define things. It's easier to get rid of the the variables that aren't relevant. Whereas in human studies or medical yeah. studies, and you can do you can you can have ten trillion collisions at at the Large Hadron Collider. But if you're doing an epidemiological study. A large sample might be three people right. because it's hard to deal with do experiments on people. That means you should be, by the way, much more suspicious. And so we should learn that when we come out with these medical studies, you should ask how many people are involved. What were mm -hmm. the? So I think that again, the example should be that that uh, we should be skeptical, and that's a great thing to be. In okay. experimental physics, predictions are verified to a very large number of significant figures and if they're not you, you, you're, you're un unhappy in biology you, pl you plot a kind of scatter plot um, when you have dots all and you've got a, and you're happy if there's a sort of vague upward trend <laughs> <laughs> yeah so there aren't I mean that's a problem I mean uh, my biologist friends of mine tell me that and I don't know if you agree but that the problem is well in biology things are often not generalizable they're very specific to yeah. organisms or individuals yes. within a species and so it's, it's very difficult to make general th theorems. Right. Mm. And maybe it will be impossible, but you know, physics, you can. And, and and the, and the, the nutritional things you're talking about, right, you, whether coffee is good for you or yeah. bad for you, whatever it is, um, if, the, if the relationship between whatever it is, the, the, do, the dosage of the substance, whatever it is, and, w and whether it's good for you, if it's U-shaped, or S-shaped, oh, yeah. then you're only studying a small yeah. part of the curve, very likely, mm -hmm. and so it's good for you up to this point. And then the top of the curve, it goes down again, it's bad for you. Um, and and the, the, the true relationship may be much more complicated than, than that even. But there's also, by the way, a, a, a big problem, I think that, uh, and it's, so it's not, I, I blame journalists, but scientists are also to blame in this sense, that in, an, in a climate where funding is limited, and universities are aware of this. You tend to see science done by press release far too mm -hmm. often. And universities want to immediately do press releases for every result. And there are reasons, but one of the reasons is to gain profile and, and, and in some sense influence funding. And, and so uh, it, it is, I see it happen far too often nowadays. I don't think it was always done that way. I think it's recent, uh, probably because of the ability to, to, to actually put something on the web. So I think that we tend to 
too often uh, announce results by press release well before they've been studied or peer reviewed. And so when I, uh, almost everything I read, I, I think that's probably garbage. And, and especially, and, and we should have to teach people this. If it sounds stupid or ridiculous, in particular, um, I, my mantra is that I learned from the publisher of the New York Times who said, if you, I'd like to keep an open mind, but not so open that my brains fall out. And, and so you ask yourself when you read that, do, if I'm going to believe that, do my brains have to fall out? And if they do, then it's probably wrong. <laughs> and and so that's, it's, it's that simple. There's nothing profound about it. Yeah. It's, uh, it contradicts everything I know. So, it, you know, I should be skeptical about it. There are studies showing the, the numbers of citations of scientific papers, and it's terribly skewed. There, there, there are a few scientific papers which are massively cited by lots of other people. The great majority of scientific papers are never, ever cited, and yeah. probably never, ever read. Yeah, most it's of the stuff in, in is exactly, and most of it goes in the dustbin of history. But that's another great thing, because y y y the way you do science is having an idea that actually has an impact on others. It's not just, if you claim it, it's one thing, but when other people find it interesting, to test that idea, then it's important. And there are some really good examples in physics, I don't know if there are in biology, of actually one of the most cited papers in physics um, by Steve Weinberg, uh, who won the Nobel Prize for it later, was, had one citation for the first 10 years. Yeah. It was not because yeah. it just, it just the things hadn't caught up with it. Too far ahead of its time. It's, in a way, yeah. yeah. And, and, then, and so it's neat to see that that, that the discipline can find, eventually find the gems in the coal, you know. Mm. Mm. As a depressing capper to that thread, uh, one of the most controversial papers in psychology uh, in the last few years was Daryl Bem's paper purporting to show psychic evidence for psychic powers. Mm. Um, this was published in, in like the top psychology journal. And uh, a group of other researchers did a replication of it and it failed to replicate. And they brought that to the journal and the journal said, oh, we don't publish replications. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, no. It says something about psychology, doesn't yeah. it? Uh. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to applaud not that. Not a lot of psychologists <laughs> in the audience, I see. <laughs> um, so do you have any advice for people for how to distinguish the science they can, like, you know, confidently quote from the science they can't, or is it, is it just... Well, I try to say, um, first ask yourself, is it, does it seem reasonable? Now, look, it, it just because it doesn't seem reasonable doesn't mean it's true, but it's a good first pass. Mm -hmm. And don't believe, so don't believe what you read. It's what every, everyone tells, it's not just science. Historians, any teacher should be teaching kids to be skeptical and be critical mm -hmm. of what they read. And, and then ask yourself, is it logical? And are, is there evidence against it? And that, those are guidances for life, and that's what... I don't think we should see science because of the facts of it. I mean, I, I love the facts of the universe. I like to get people excited about it. But in school, most people aren't going to become scientists. What right. they really need to learn are those techniques. Right. Is it something I, I desperately want to believe? Yeah. Then, then, then be skeptical about it. And right. is the person who's saying it got a vested interest in right. it? Yeah. And that's always amazes me that people, people uh, when you, uh, politicians give remarks, and you ask, you know, when a senator from a coal state in my country, mm -hmm. says, you know what, global warming isn't real. You gotta ask yourself, well, let's see, what interest do they have in making that statement? And no one, and, and, and even journalists don't, aren't open and saying, well, this guy is, or many journalists, they say, you know, maybe, maybe, he's, maybe he's got a reason and a vested interest for doing that, we shouldn't listen to him. There's the rules of politeness and niceties yeah. getting in the way of clarity well, again. Well, journalists should not be nice. <laughs> no, I think, I think there's a <laughs> huge problem of, uh, in, again, of journalists, well, but it, there's a problem with it. Anyway, it, it, if you're not nice, then you don't get invited to the White House press briefings. And so there's this, and Noam Chomsky's talked mm -hmm. about this a lot, if, you're, if you don't play along, then you don't have access. Right. And so there's this, there's this real, real Very issue. narrow yeah. path to walk, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if I mentioned this to you guys, but we have a, a surprise video guest uh, who wanted to make a comment for you to respond to. You know Rebecca Goldstein? Yes. Oh, yeah. All right. Uh, just, with, just with her. So. Maybe the video people can uh, start Where do we putting look? the projection uh, up. up there. Just to introduce her, she's <laughs> a, a novelist and philosopher. Um, she did her PhD in philosophy, and she's written a bunch of books um, on Gödel and Spinoza, uh, Plato, and, um, and she won the MacArthur Genius Grant, um, which is a prestigious uh, award to young, young researchers. So she, uh, I, I told her about this debate, and she wanted to comment uh, remotely um, and see it's what you guys have to everyone say. Everyone keeps calling it a debate. It's a discussion. Oh, yeah. 
I was okay. complaining about that earlier, and then yeah. I did it myself. Okay. Okay. All right, Rebecca, over to you. Hi, Richard. Hi, Lawrence. So I think one of the reasons that scientists often regard philosophers as well, ridiculous is that they view philosophers as trying to do the same thing that they're doing, that scientists are doing, as um, being in competition uh, with, with scientists. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, if that's what philosophers are up to, then they're ridiculous. I'm going to propose um, a different alternative, and I'd love to get your reaction to it. Um, and this view of philosophy is very influenced by the uh, views of a 20th century American philosopher, Wilfred Sellers. Uh, Sellers uh, proposes a view of philosophy as a kind of mediator between what he calls the scientific image of man, uh, which is, of course, always progressing, and uh, these core intuitions that we have, um, that we bring to bear in trying to make sense of the world. And uh, some of them, frankly, uh, clash uh, with the um, but the scientific image. They have to be corrected in the light of the scientific image, or uh, maybe they do, maybe they don't. Uh, so, for example, our view of time is flowing. Does it need to be corrected in the light of, of uh, relativity theory? Our views about free will, do they have to be uh, corrected in the light of um, uh, the scientific image and what it has to say? Um, uh, about, about our choices. I like this view very, very much because it shows science and philosophers joined at the hip and joined together um, in the project of, of reason. So enjoy your conference and bye-bye. So I, I invited her to submit a question because I know, um, I think both of you, but especially Lawrence, have clashed with philosophers <laughs> over uh, what role philosophy has to, to play in our, our uh, I th search I think for knowledge said, and, and I th truth. I think she said what I said, but you know, she, didn't, she said it more politely. Um, <laughs> uh, that philosophy doesn't have a role in, uh, if I interpreted what she said right, and it was hard to hear everything there, that, um, philo that philosophers can reflect on what scientists discover. Uh, but, but the discoveries are not up to the philosophers. And, and, that, and that's not a pejorative thing. It's a fact. That, and it, it depends on the field. In physics, philosophy has no place whatsoever. I mean, in the said professional philosophers, it's not as if we don't, people say, but I'm doing philosophy, I'm asking philosophical questions. Yeah, but the questions in physics are, have moved so far beyond the kind of early questions that philosopher asked, philosophers asked that physicists don't read philosophers, they can't spell philosophy, and, but there are other areas of human activity where we don't know things so well, like consciousness, mm -hmm. and there philosophers have a much more important role to play because they can frame questions. But the answer is ultimately determined by the scientific method, not by pure thought or philosophical reflection. I don't know. I, do I'm trying to think of, of I mean, I, I do, get something out of reading philosophy papers sometimes, and I'm trying to think um, what would be the best examples I can think of. Something like um, the sort of brain in a vat thought experiments, mm -hmm. where you, you, Im you imagine something that's not actually possible to do, yeah. but nevertheless, um, if you uh, download every single bit of your b brain, or indeed your body, into a, into a different person by some futuristic science fiction teleportation system. So at some point in time, a twin of me is created who is exactly the same in every atom and presumably has exactly the same memories, the same thoughts, the same desires as I have. Um, from at, at the moment of his creation, we are the same person. But then we start diverging mm -hmm. because we, we are, we're no longer in the same place. We go into different places. We then, I mean, th that's philosophically interesting. It's paradoxical. It makes you think what is the nature of personal identity. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, when a split brain patient, and this is where some real science comes in, yeah. in a split brain um, person um, 
where you can show that the brain, the side of the brain that controls speech, says something different and sees something different and understands something different from the other side of the brain, which can only communicate by pointing, for example. And so you have a contradiction between what the left brain and what the right brain knows. Um, well, if, say, the left brain votes conservative and the right brain votes labor, or the left brain is religious and the right brain is, is an atheist, um, or if the left brain has criminal tendencies and the right brain is very law-abiding, um, does this raise problems about personal identity? Does, does it raise problems about um, justice? Uh, can, you, can you sentence this person for a crime when only half the brain did it? And the split brain, the split brain um, is, a, is a particularly extreme example. But then you could say, well, um, multiple personality syndrome, where there appears to be, um, this is again importing some science into it, um, you, you, you wake up it one morning and you're a different person from what you were the, the previous morning. Can you attach concepts like blame? Um, I think this is a place where philosophical reasoning is something we all need to do. I'm not sure that professional philosophers exactly. who've read Aristotle and Hume and Locke are, any, are much better qualified to do that. I suppose in a sense they are because they know what mistakes have been made, what have been suggested in the past. Well, yeah, I mean, it, I mean the, the virtue of teaching philosophy is to teach people how to carefully look at reason arguments and, and, and analyze them and look for, look for logical flaws and such. But everything you said is really, in some sense, reflecting the virtue of philosophy is to reflect on the knowledge that empirical, mm. that empirical investigation deals with. Even the Gedanken experiment that you talked about at the beginning, mm. about imagining this, mm. and then the minute that's okay, that's pure imagination, but then you say the minute they're in different bodies, they have different access to mm. the, the stimuli, and then, well, then you say, well, that, that, that idea comes from looking at identical twins, and, and so you're basing your, your, your investigation always, it seems to me, on empirical data, um, but, but philosophy is good at maybe, frame, as I say, framing some of those questions, but, but, but the question is, is, it's not the question of, is philosophy useful? We all do philosophy, if you want to, but I, I question don't. is, are philosophers useful? Well, and that, the <laughs> answer is clearly no, but, but. <laughs> I was sitting here thinking, man, Lawrence has really changed his No, tune. no, I no, had to I say just, that. Okay. No, I mean, the, 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 some of them are and some of them aren't. It's like any field. But I think those philosophers who think they're doing science, I, are, no, well, I'll get in trouble, but. but <laughs> has that ever stopped you before? No, Chris? and I won't now. Um, it's not a value judgment that, they, that scientists don't read the philosophy of science. Professional philosophers who do philosophy of science tend to talk to other professional philosophers who do philosophy of science and has no impact whatsoever on the progress of science. Now, that doesn't mean it's not useful in some way for, for human investigation, but, it, but to make the presumption that it leads science is just empirically wrong. And, and I, and that offends some people, but it's true. All right, okay. fair. Uh, you, you agree? I mean, you, you have, yeah. you, anyway, I don't know. I'll let well, you, I've, I've said my, said my, you I've said my piece. Here. Okay, yeah, okay. Uh, now I want to uh, introduce another um, guest questioner, uh, Professor Herman Phillips, who is actually in the audience today, so hopefully one of our uh, assistants can, can locate him. Um, uh, Professor he, Philip he is located already. Oh, excellent. So let me just give him a brief introduction. He's a, a professor at Utrecht University. Forgive my pronunciation. Oh, hi, everyone. Uh, there they are. He's, he, Even uh, there are people out there? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Look at all the people up there, too. Uh, arguably, I, I think you could call him the Dutch Richard Dawkins. Uh, I've heard that term bandied about. Oh, um, good for him. He's the writer of the Atheist Manifesto, um, as well as a, a bunch of other books, and most uh, recently, God in the Age of Science. Question mark. Uh, so, if Professor Phillips uh, uh, is so inclined, uh, we've ha we've been talking a lot about the interaction oh, between is. science and philosophy. Yeah. I know you have a lot of thoughts on those subjects, some of which might contradict those of our guests. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, we'd appreciate it. Yes, let me first express my delight to be in presence of Lawrence and um, 
and Richard again. Uh, I greatly ad admire their writings, and I must confess that I, I agree with most of what they are saying, even what is said about philosophy just now. I think that since about the 1920s, no philosopher who is um, well, well in his wits will claim to do factual discoveries or so yeah. on. So, so what philosophers now, nowadays do is much more logical analysis of text and clarification of concepts and so on. And my question um, is related to this type of clarification. When I read both of the books, um, well, when they were published, so The God Illusion, delightful book, I can recommend it, and then The Universe from Nothing, which I recommend as well, I saw that um, there was one rule that you both applied, and that is the principle of simplicity, or, or what was mentioned in the beginning of this evening, that if we have a complex explanation and we have a more simple explanation, we should prefer the more simple one. And you both seem to, um, well, to accept that one. Um, now, let me ask you very briefly um, a question about uh, the so-called fine-tuning argument. Um, we all know, physicists clearly discovered, that the constants of laws of nature have to be in quite a limited uh, selection of all the possible values they have if life would be possible in our universe. And that's called fine-tuning, and it's a very complex topic. I will not go into the complexities. Now, there are three different explanations of fine-tuning. If you wonder why is our universe fine-tuned for life, so that life is possible. There are three possible explanations. One is it's simply a matter of accident, completely accidental. Now, most physicists would probably react by saying, well, then it is very improbable. Another explanation is God designed the universe in such a way that life would be possible because he's good and he intended to do that. And then, of course, the likelihood of fine-tuning is very, very high, maybe even one. And a third explanation says, well, let's suppose there is a multiverse. There are maybe infinitely many worlds, and of course we live in a world that is such that life is possible, otherwise we wouldn't be there, but there are infinitely many other worlds in which life would not be possible. And then of course the likelihood that life is possible in one of these worlds is also very high, maybe one. Now, both of you prefer the multiverse hypothesis over the God hypothesis. But, of course, philosophers would say, well, the multiverse hypothesis is much more complex. It posits much more, ent many more entities. Mm -hmm. So, according to your own rule, you should prefer the God hypothesis. What, of that? what about that? Well, uh, you don't really believe that, do you? Yeah. Oh, of course not. <laughs> But well, I, I, I want I, to know your answer. I'll, <laughs> I'll, let, I'll, let, I'll let Richard answer first, because I know what it's going to be, and it's going to be a good answer. And then I'll, I'll come up with something else, so go start. Uh, <laughs> start. <laughs> first of all, my, our, our research group in Oxford used to have a, a thing which we called the Cambridge version of Occam's Razor. And the Cambridge version of Occam's Razor is never be satisfied with a simple explanation if a more complicated one is available. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, I would absolutely dispute, and I'm sure uh, Professor Philipson would as well, the suggestion that the God hypothesis is simple. Yeah. Um, it is not simple. Not. Uh, the, the, the multiverse hypothesis actually is rather simple. It's rather extravagant. It's wasteful in the sense that it postulates a very large number of universes. Um, but the God hypothesis is a total non-starter because it postulates the very thing that it's trying to explain, which is something improbable. We're trying to explain the alleged fine-tuning of the universe, which, by the way, not all physicists accept. Some of yeah. them... I'll, I'll elaborate on that. You elaborate on that. Um, uh, but as, even, even if it's true that the universe is fine-tuned uh, in the sense that perhaps the physical constants, half a dozen or so physical constants, if they were ever so slightly different, um, if any one of them was ever so slightly different, then... Um, we wouldn't have a universe like we have that's capable of generating us. Um, the, the God hypothesis has got to postulate a being, an entity, which has the cognitive ability to know exactly how to twiddle those knobs of the physical constants in order to get them exactly right. 
And that's just as difficult a problem as, as simply saying, well, the knobs just come already twiddled. It doesn't solve the problem at all. And one of the things that, that Darwin is, we're way out of, of, of Darwin's depth now, and he's talking about biology, but one of the things that Darwin did for us is to raise our consciousness to the power of explaining things in terms of simple beginnings and development into complexity later. It would be very easy to imagine that the universe in which we lived was designed by some alien creature. We're all living in a, in a simulation that was, that was designed by, by some alien creature. But that alien creature would itself have to have evolved by some gradual, explicable process. You cannot get away with saying, I explain complexity by postulating other complexity. Mm -hmm. Now, there are theologians who say, oh, God is, uh, is infinitely simple. Yeah. What utter nonsense. If God was infinitely <laughs> simple, he, couldn't, he wouldn't know how to fine-tune the universe. And he certainly wouldn't know how to listen to your prayers, forgive your sins, decide who to save from cancer and who not to save from cancer, and all the other things that he's supposed to do. But even if we just let him be a sort of deistic God, he wouldn't know how to fine-tune the universe unless he was already fine-tuned himself. That's a complete non-starter. The multiverse theory, uh, it's, it's disputable whether you'd call it complex. I don't think it's that complex. Um, but it's, it's, sort of, it's got a kind of Darwinian feel to it, which I quite like. Well, let, let me, yeah. okay, I, I, I knew uh, Richard would allow, go, hit that key point that, that God, I, God is not simple. But, it, but, there's, but there's two major faults with your premise. Um, first of all, it turns out the multiverse hypothesis is relatively simple, but you know you, you don't need it. And in fact, I just wrote a piece that, it's in the New Yorker today, and it's about, that points out the big fallacy. You, what you said is, in my opinion, logically incorrect in the sense that you're assuming that those are the only three arguments. You're assuming the universe is fine-tuned for life, but more likely is that life is fine-tuned for the universe. This is exactly the problem that Darwin solved in the case of life on Earth. People thought the earth was fine-tuned for life, and that's why there had to be a god. The, everything was designed on earth for man or beasts, and how could, you know, everything was just set up, and God had created the Garden of Eden and all this stuff, but what Gar Darwin showed was, no, life is fine-tuned for the conditions of the earth, and natural selection fine-tunes different species to exist in the environments in which they live. So the fact that the constants of nature allow life to exist is to forget the multiverse. It's much more likely that life happens to exist in this universe because it can. And if it couldn't, it wouldn't. And it's so that life, is, as we know it, is fine-tuned for the universe in which we live. But you also make the presumption that all life must be like the life we experience. And of course, that is also a closed-minded assumption. If the conditions and the fine constants of nature were very different, we do not know, but, how, but it's presumptuous in the extreme to assume that other forms of very different kind of life couldn't evolve in that circumstance. It's true that the, the conditions, the, fine, the constants of our universe were vastly different. We couldn't evolve, but it's presumptuous to assume something else couldn't evolve. So the whole question is a red herring in my mind, and it makes the exact mistake in cosmology that people made in, about biology before Darwin. And I think what we're learning is that cosmology hopefully can, can, can have the same realizations that Darwin developed, which is that, that it's, con it's confusing cause and effect. So, you know, yeah, anyway. I think you've... <laughs> I, I'd be very happy to make that case for life, um, where, where we say um, this particular planet is um, suitable for life, and you could make yeah. it exactly the point you make. However, I suspect that Dr. Philipson would come back, and I think rightly, and say, we're not just talking about life. Um, according to some physicists, if the fundamental constants were different, uh, if the gravitational constant was different, say, you wouldn't have stars. Well, so yeah, you wouldn't have chemistry, you wouldn't have... Um, right, but, you know, Freeman... But how, so you wouldn't have stars, you wouldn't have chemistry. That, you can't uh, say that you, you wouldn't have a black cloud like, like Fred Hoyle, that wouldn't be intelligence. You could, it, I think it's really a limitation of the imagination to argue. And in fact, the point is, if I change the gravitational constant, 
then I could change a host of other things and still ah, have conflict. Ah, now that's a good point. And, and, um, so, and so to change one thing and say, oh, if I change this, yeah, the yeah. world would be different. Well, why would you just change that one I thing? Agree. So I mean, it could have been got, vastly got, different and still had yeah, stars. We've got, we've got six knobs to yeah. twiddle. And we're only so far talking about twiddling them one at a time. And I th suspect it's probably, it, could, it could be right that if you twiddle them one at a time, you end up with, an in, with an, a universe that not only couldn't produce life, but couldn't produce chemistry or, or but matter. You know, but yeah, the interesting question is, I mean, it's right, and, but it's, it's more than that. And I've had this debate with Freeman Dyson, who's a well-known physicist and friend who's a very smart guy, about whether, about whether life can exist forever in the universe, and, and, and he said yes, and I said no, and I'm right, and he's wrong. But, but, uh, um, but besides that, but he, what he's very ingenious about is pointing out that you can imagine computation, which is essentially intelligence, existing in many different systems, and a black cloud was one example. You could, you could embody in the motion of particles, of any kind of particles, you could embody in that a computational system. And so it's very myopic which is what science tries to teach us not to be, to assume that life has to be organic, that life has to exist on stars, that you couldn't just have electron-positron pairs a trillion years from now that, that somehow um, embody a kind of consciousness. We don't know how, but saying, not knowing how doesn't mean it can't happen. Yeah, I think that, but I, I was going, going to go on to say that e even if you limit yourself to the kind of life that we know with, with mm. matter and things, yeah. Twiddling more no. than one knob at a, at a time. And I've, I've written papers showing yeah. that these claims about certain fine-tuned parameters yeah. are garbage. If you yes. allow, if you allow them to be more than one knob to be twiddled, yeah. you can show you can reproduce things exactly. And moreover, yes. some of the apparent fine-tuning, I can imagine, and this is one of the ones that the, reli the, the religious guys use a lot. There's one parameter in the universe called the cosmological constant, the energy of empty space, which appears to be fine-tuned to 120 orders of magnitude. If it was larger, we wouldn't exist. And they say, well, that's evidence of design. But the point is, if it were zero, which from a physics perspective is much more natural, the universe would be a better place for life. So, it, it, so it's not fine. To, it, we can exist here, but it'd be better if it wasn't. wasn't. So that apparent fine-tuning is also just garbage. But, the, but the, the, the really important point is that whatever else it is, the God hypothesis is, is the worst of all. That, exactly, I mean, yeah. because it assumes more complexity. <laughs> yeah. No, because it assumes more complexity, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. No, that, that's why we, I wanted you to give it first, because I think a, it was the there's key. A, <laughs> there's, a, there's a theologian, an Oxford theologian called, called Swinburne, who says on the one hand, God is infinitely simple, because he's just one explanation for everything. On the other hand, you need God because if, if there wasn't God, every electron in the universe would behave differently. God has his fingers on every single electron, yeah, every single fundamental particle, making sure they all behave properly. Yeah, well, a I mean, look, well, let's, we're beating a dead horse, and, and, yeah. which is a nice way of calling God. But, uh, <laughs> but the point, it seems to me the, the key point is that, is that God... God is an excuse for stopping thinking, ultimately. Because you say, look, I can't explain this, so I assume there's something I can't explain that, ex that, that created it all. And ultimately, it's the I most extreme form of intellectual laziness I know of. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there were many, many things to, to like about that thread of the conversation. But I have to admit, one of my favorite was the frequency of getting to hear Richard say twiddle. <laughs> that was just very enjoyable. Knob, knob twiddling. Yeah. Knob twiddling. OK, good. Uh, so I, I want to make sure we have time for Q&A. Um, we have about 20 minutes left. Um, and a, a bunch of you submitted questions um, before the program. And uh, two of the organizers have gone through them and, and selected some of the questions that uh, would be best to go through. So they're going to go through the audience and, and find you and invite you to, to ask your question. Can we turn the lights up, though? Yeah, please. OK, good. There we go. Excellent. Um, so do we have, yes, we have someone ready to ask the first question. Yeah, um, my name is Glenn. Uh, let me first uh, thank you uh, for being here tonight. My question is a very simple one, uh, mainly aimed uh, to Professor Dawkins. I want to ask him what's the most valuable piece of advice you would give a future biology teacher and more generally speaking, what's the most valuable piece of advice the both of you would give to any future science teacher who's aspiring to make a change? I hate the advice question. Yeah, we're right. <laughs> <at it. laughs> 
I never know, I never know <laughs> what to say. But we've, it's sort of come out implicitly in everything that we've been, we've been saying. Things like be, be sceptical, doubt, uh, doubt your own convictions. But I suppose I would reiterate the point about never lose your sense of wonder, never, never lose your, your sense of what an extraordinary place we, li we live in, what an extraordinary fact of our, is the fact of our existence. And when you're doing science, you're, you're rejoicing in that fact in a very tangible, intelligent way. You're not just lying back and saying, oh, isn't it all marvelous? Mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're saying that, but then you're also dissecting it down and, and understanding where the marvelousness comes from. And that would be true of, of, of any science, although the details of how it would show itself would be different in biology from, from, from physics. But, but uh, as be honest, um, uh, be, be, be persistent. I once went to a conference, a, a very posh conference in Germany, um, where um, it was a conference of mostly sort of Nobel Prize winners, but each Nobel Prize winner was allowed to take along one uh, sort of young um, lieutenant, mm -hmm. and I was young then, and I went along with Nico Tinbergen. And among the Nobel Prize winners was Hans Krebs, and he was asked the, the, asked the, the advice question. And his answer was, seemed to me to be sort of too humble. He said, if you want to be, get, a, get a Nobel Prize, go into the lab every day at 9 o'clock, go home at 5 p.m. and repeat for 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, okay. But, there, but it, I think the question also had the aspect of a teacher. And I think that's yeah, a, yeah. And, and there, it's a, it's a big challenge. And, and, of, and as my friend Steve Weinberg says, who's an atheist, he said, you're doing God's work. Um, and really, you're at the front lines. And I think the, the thing many teachers are afraid to do is show enthusiasm. Is somehow explaining w that why they are interested seems parochial. But in fact, that's what you have to do, it seems to me, if you're a teacher, is to never lose sight of the fact that it's okay to show why you are enthusiastic about something. And in fact, if you don't, you won't expect your, don't expect your students to, to be enthusiastic at all. I, I often tell teachers, and people have heard me say this, but it, it's, I nevertheless it's the best advice I know. The biggest mistake any teacher makes is to assume your students are interested in what you have to say. Because <laughs> you've lost them. Okay? We have another question? Somewhere? Ah, oh, here we go. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Stan. Uh, I think uh, these days uh, Catholic Church is losing its influence. I think, do you think that uh, <laughs> do you think uh, religion will die out or at least practically die out before humans go extinct? Before what? Before humans go extinct? Uh, yes. Yeah. Oh. Sorry. Uh. <laughs> well, there's a difference between hope and expectation, isn't there? Yeah. Um, uh, I, I, I think it's, it's I, I gain encouragement from the shifting zeitgeist. It's not just a shifting moral zeitgeist, it's a shifting intellectual zeitgeist as well. Um, the more educated countries, the more educated people, the less likely they are to be religious. Um, uh, social welfare tends to be, tends to undermine religion for the, the Gregory Paul thing that um, Lawrence was talking about earlier. Um, Looking at the world today, one has to be pessimistic about the Islamic world at present, um, but they, 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 they're 500 years behind, yeah, whatever sure. it is. And um, so um, 500 years <laughs> sounds like an awful long time. Um, and I, I don't think we'll be extinct in 500 years, although it's not, not impossible. Yeah, I mean, all the evidence is that and it, that, that uh, as you point out, it's monotonically, not just the Catholic Church, every church in the, in the, in the, mo in the advanced world, in the first world, uh, attendance is going down monotonically every single place. And so that says something. And you could imagine, if you were a scientist, you might extrapolate that curve and ask where it's going to hit zero. There are big, huge forces that, that are trying to stop that, I think, and, and it's going to be challenging. Um, uh, but as we said uh, about the, the other issue, I think... It's always, if you think about it, just one generation away. So the children are always the hope. And if we can ultimately educate children, uh, which is really the problem of the third world in the in Islamic world, it's, 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 
it's that they work very hard to make sure children aren't educated. And, uh, or uh, just read one book. And, and yeah, and women aren't educated, which is the, which is the, real, the real travesty. And, and so I think uh, the hope is that we, w if we can work very hard to bring education to children, then, then the rest is inevitable, I think. I, I think it's Ayan Hirsi Ali has made the rather pessimistic suggestion that we actually need to support Christianity. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I would quote Hilaire Belloc's couplet that goes, always keep a hold of nurse for fear of finding something worse. <laughs> well, but you think know, about that. It, it, but, well, but I, I sort of I don't know whether I agree with that so much. But I do think it's a, we should we should turn the whole world into the Church of England, and the reason yeah. is um, because it's so innocuous. Um, that what that's been pointed out in that in the United States, one of the reasons that such a religion is so successful is paradoxically the fact that there is enshrined a separation of church and state. At least it's supposed to be enshrined, and um, and that you know you think that would be a good thing to limit the power of religion, but what it did effectively in England, the, which the or any country which has a state church, the church gets lazy because they're guaranteed funds, they're guaranteed an existence, so they can be the Church of England, and no, you know everyone just smiles and doesn't listen. But but uh, but in a country like the United States, where the churches have to be have to be uh, entrepreneurial. Entre entrepreneurial. That's the word I was thinking about. They have to be entrepreneurial to exist. Entrepreneurship works, and they become they become really good at reaching out and, and at advertising and all the rest. So if we just had an entrenched church in the United States, then it'd be lazy, and you wouldn't you wouldn't need all these so successful churches. So uh, it, it's an interesting paradoxical statement yeah. about 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 the success mm. of religion. Mm. I mean, it's interesting. You go to a Catholic country like Italy, and stores are are open on the weekend, but in many places in the United States, it's just it's a it's a novel thing because it seems sacrilegious. Mm. Great. Next question. Thank you. Uh, hello, my oh. name is Dirk. I have a short question. Uh, do you think that Mohammed cartoons are helping the atheist case? What, what did you say? That, that what are helping the atheist case? The Mohammed cartoons. The cartoons about Mohammed. Oh, oh, Mohammed cartoons are helping. What was the that? Do, do you think that cartoons of Muhammad are helping the atheist case? Um, yeah. Well, ultimately, in the long term, I think we, uh, we have to encourage ridicule. Because the more times we encourage ridicule, the less, uh, l the less fearsome it'll seem. And, and by being afraid to ridicule something, we elevate it to a level that it shouldn't have. And nothing in our, nothing, no idea, no idea should be above ridicule. It's the best tool we have. I think one of the most shocking things about not just this episode, but going back to the Salman Rushdie yeah. fatwa is the way uh, our kind of people, liberal intellectuals, uh. have betrayed intellectualism, have betrayed liberalism by um, doling out this ridiculous respect. Mm -hmm. Respect for what? Uh, in the time of the Salman Rushdie thing, there were liberal intellectuals, bishops and people falling over themselves to condemn this distinguished novelist mm -hmm. for writing a novel. Somehow he brought it upon himself. He was asking for it. Same with the Charlie Hebdo uh, cartoons. Um, Freedom of speech is something that we really do need to fight for. And uh, we need to um, come out into support. I don't, I, I, I don't particularly like the, 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 the style of cartoon in Charlie Hebdo. That doesn't make the slightest difference. They should be free to do it. It's not the business of, of other people to, um, of, of, obviously not the business of the, of, the, of the murderers, that goes without saying, but liberals who Tacitly, you know, I'm against the, the murders, but Charlie Hebdo people brought it upon, upon themselves. That's a betrayal. That's a disgusting betrayal. Well, you know, it is. <laughs> and I, I, I want to give a more modern example, which, which really depresses me, and related to Charlie Hebdo, which is one of these I brought out. Um, so the New York Times, which is a paper I terribly <laughs> write for, every now and then, and I respect for in general, would not would not publish this picture. They had three articles about this picture, but they wouldn't publish it. 
This, this is, you know, it's, it's, it's a wonderful picture. It says, you know, everything's forgiven. You know, it's, and it's a, but they publish pictures of the, of the terrorists in Paris shooting a, a police officer who was, who was injured. Now, I find that much more offensive, personally. Now, the point is, should they not publish that because it offends me? No, because if you're offended, you own the problem. You own the problem if you're offended. And if, you're, if it's a problem for you, you're, the obligation for you is to speak out and try and explain why the person offending you is wrong. And so you should not be worried about people who are offended. It's their problem. And they have ample alternatives to try and overcome that. And so this, this disgusting idea that somehow, and I know the New York Times didn't do it, I, I'm afraid, unfortunately. They did not not publish it because they were worried about offending Muslims. They didn't publish it because they were worried about violence. But if we stop doing what's necessary because we're worried about violence, then we've lost. I like the remark of... Um, Christopher Hitchens said, um, you're offended, I'm still waiting to hear your argument. Exactly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and by the way, I will say that I'm drinking this in tribute to Christopher <laughs> Hitchens, in case you're wondering why I'm having a whiskey. <laughs> okay. I didn't... It didn't seem like something that needed explanation, but <laughs> I, I like the explanation nonetheless. Yeah. Uh, well, I was just also, it's an experiment. I'm a physicist. I, he, he never seemed to lose his cogent rationality in the... I don't find that works. He for was me, a one-off. Yeah, you know. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, the other, the other one, rather similar quote from from Stephen Fry was, "You're offended. Well, so fucking what?" <laughs> <laughs> Great. All right. Next question. That's a good one. Okay, Hi, uh, my name is Chris. Uh, my question is related to the previous one, but I'd I like to give it a more positive twist. So, as the Charlie Hebdo attacks, they were like almost universally condemned. So do you think there's a chance that it actually might bring the religions more closely together instead of pulling them apart? I didn't hear all of that. Oh, um, so the Charlie Hebdo attacks were almost universally condemned. So is, is there a chance that this whole incident could bring religions together rather than pulling them apart? Well, Richard gave a good point to me today, which you maybe want to repeat, that some people are saying, well, you want to say it? Well, <laughs> it, um, first, I'm not sure why bringing religions together is particularly... I don't know what I'm going to do. No, I, I agree. R bringing <laughs> religions together is kind of like the, the, the Lord of the Rings, where you bring all the dark forces together yeah. and you don't want to do that. But I, I think the, po the point that... Uh, it, it's not actually my point, but, but, but I'm, I, I made it to, to Lawrence today, is that the murderers, the thugs, um, might actually have been wanting to bring down universal condemnation and odium from the rest of the world because they want... Um, Muslims to feel beleaguered and threatened mm -hmm. because they want Muslims to rise up and, uh, and um, fight. And so um, it could be that we're playing into their hands uh, yeah. and who knows? I mean, yeah, I, but I, I think, again, you know, you're, I think it's a great point. It hadn't occurred to me. On the other hand, it seems to me you can't worry about that. You just have to uh, um, do what you believe in. And, yes. uh, and I, I ultimately think that, that well, you all know. I mean, you know, this what this journal had this fifty thousand person subscription rate, or sold fifty thousand, and this issue was five million. Seems to me that's a good thing. Yeah, it, it's a good thing unless it has the the effect that unless that's what they were actually wanting. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. And and but you know, then you quest, uh, then you hope that you could counter that by yeah. thinking about it. But you're right. It's a, it's an int it's hard for me to believe really that there's that level of of strategic analysis yeah. Um, yeah. but but it's hard to it's hard to know <laughs> yeah next question good good evening oh. to your left hi um, first of all thank you for coming and I hope this is the first of many visits to continental Europe um, my question to you is what kind of scientific discovery if you can envision a scientific discovery that you think would tilt the balance of the public opinion away from religion and towards science and reason? Did you get that? I, I would, would, what scientific discovery would tilt the balance? Yeah. Well, I, I can think of two. You can, be, no, I'll, you can think a little more if you want. But, because um, uh, I, I speak without thinking, Richard thinks before speaking. That's the difference. Um, but, uh, 
And both of them relate to the nature of the origin of life. I think, first of all, if we can demonstrate the, um, the natural mechanism by which non-life turned into life by, uh, in, in the laboratory, that will be a significant development which will impact on this idea of the sanctity of light, life. The other one, it would be the discovery of intelligence elsewhere in the universe. Uh, which would, I think, if, if, which is a far more remote possibility. The first possibility, I think, will happen in the lifetime of most of the people in this room. I do think we're close enough to honing in on the origin of, on the, on the origin of life, which is not what Darwin talked about, right? He talked about the, the origin of species. Uh, so I think that will happen, and it will have an, ima- an amazing impact. It'll have the same impact, I think, if, it, many of you are younger than me in this room, but you might remember the Catholic Church, which, of course, is always behind the times, was, uh, w- uh, was, and still is, against in vitro fertilization. You know, they're supposed to be pro-life, but they're against having a baby without having sex, <laughs> which is amazing because they're against sex. <laughs> but, but, um, but, but the interesting thing is the argument they used to give, if you read back in the old days, and we remember this, was that these kids would not have a soul because if they weren't the product of sex, they somehow wouldn't have a soul because God wouldn't have intended it, okay? And then, it's, which is stupid, of course, but what's amazing and important is the minute the first baby was born, the first test tube baby was born, that argument just stopped because it was obviously stupid. So uh, uh, you never hear that mentioned anymore. The church never, never talks about those kids not having a soul because it would be ridiculous. So I kind of think that kind of evidence that that, they're, that it's so obvious that if, if we can develop it, that life develops from non-life by just natural, clear explanations will go a long way. The, the discovery of alien, intelligent life, I think, would be the other thing because it would just demonstrate that many of our myopic ro- notions are wrong. Yes, the, the, the origin of life would be a fascinating thing to do. To, it always astonishes me that they pin so much faith in that, actually. Yeah. That they, they, they clearly, having lost on evolution, they've, they've now kind of retreated to the origin of life. Um, but of course, that it's totally illogical. So it never even occurred to me that that was a. That, but it would be a very interesting thing, um, and I, I long for it to happen. I'd, I'd love to know how it, how it started. Um, the 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 other thing I suppose would be so, something in um, uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, if if um, artificial intelligence is not progressing quite as fast as some people thought it would, but mm. There, there will surely come a time when uh, a, com- a computer program behaving like a human is so convincing, so convincingly part of the Turing test, it can actually have philosophical arguments, can mm. actually feel fear and love and, mm. and, 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 and amusement, laughter, um, appreciate paradoxes, all that sort of thing. And that you actually have a proper conversation like we're having a, mm. a conversation. I think that would be terribly undermining because has the computer got a soul? Mm-hmm. Does the soul go to heaven? You know that that kind of thing, the the undermining of the of the sp- alleged special nature of the human soul. It's in, in in a way, it's already been undermined by 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 Darwin. I mean, at mm. one point, at what point in evolution does the soul yeah. um, ar- arise? But somehow that hasn't hit home. That's good. Um, good, yeah, I agree. Yeah. That would be really neat. Great answer. We have time for one more question. So whoever's next in line. It's got to be a really good one, though, right? Yeah, no pressure <laughs> or anything. You're challenging me, but I'll try. Uh, my name is uh, Kurt, and uh, speaking of uh, computer programs, uh, in the, your early books, uh, Dr. Dawkins, you are um, illustrating very nicely how you can illustrate how evolution works with computer programs. Uh, You have written some kind of computer simulations that actually illustrate very nicely how this evolution works. Now my question is, why do you not write such a program to illustrate how religion will evolve and perhaps finally die? It would be very nice to do something like that. I'm not quite sure what that would look like, but it sounds from your question as though you've got some plans of your own or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I'm not quite sure. I mean, I, it, it, if, if, if you were to, I thought you were going to ask um, you know, what, what further progress could be made in that sort of direction. And I, and I would say then that my, my programs were limited to the very 
um, a constrained ecology of a two-dimensional computer screen. And uh, more modern programs actually have creatures moving around in a simulated three-dimensional space with a real um, simulated physics where they um, don't bump into objects and they avoid each other and they um, uh, have, have a kind of reality in, w in which they live and move and have their, their being. Now, religion, um, I'm not sure what it, would be, what it would mean to write a computer simulation yeah. of I think a, you'd be religion. very... I mean, as a scientist, I'd be extremely skeptical of someone who claimed to do that because religion is a very complex human notion. I mean, at life, you can build a simple... You can only answer questions that you can answer, and we don't even understand the nature of consciousness. And people are trying to understand the, the evolutionary biology of why religions evolve, but all of this is knowledge that's just beginning, and it's such a complex question that you, I don't think you could... If anyone claimed to have a computer program that would talk about the evolution of religion, I would, I would be very skeptical of it at this point because we don't even understand, um, in the sense, what religion is or why, or why it exists at, at, in a fundamental evolutionary perspective. It's a very high-level concept, and I think we're, we're way down here, right? Don't you think? In, in one sense, I think we already have it in, the, in um, computer viruses, which are... Which are um, <laughs> Um, well, which are, yeah. which are, which are pr uh, programs that, that, that spread uh, through the um, yeah. silica sphere uh, by the mere fact that, they, that, that, that the code says spread me in one way or another, pass me on, mm -hmm. copy me, uh, etc. And they could evolve. Um, and I think that's probably what religions are. Uh, I think they are a sort of computer virus which spreads because they contain within their own code the instructions for spreading. Um, <laughs> believe in me and pass it on to your children. I mean, that's a powerful <laughs> piece really of computer, computer virus, virus code. Um, believe in me and go out and, and, and spread the word uh, in, uh, as, a, as a missionary. Um, uh, believe in me and you will have everlasting life. Um, these are all... Uh, pieces of computer code that when passed from brain to brain have the capacity to make sure they're passed on again. Um, and over the centuries, they've become pretty good at it, not surprisingly, because they've had a lot of time to evolve and perfect the techniques. Um, if you leave this religion, uh, you will be uh, executed as an apostate, mm -hmm. uh, a fairly powerful piece of computer virus code, uh, likely to get itself, if not passed on, likely to, sp to stick around once it has infected a brain. Difficult to cure uh, this particular disease when it has a weapon like that at its, at the, at its disposal. So that's just kind of thinking aloud. But, but, um, it's, it, no, it's, yeah. it's neat thinking. I think uh, religion as a virus is a great idea. But before, before, can I, I just, this is peripheral, but before sure. we end, and you might probably have some profound remarks then, but um, uh, I just want to thank the people who put this together. I've, I've done two things with this group of young people, and it's inspiring, and the fact that they could put 2,000 people together yeah, yeah, and do yeah. it so well. So I really want to thank them. Yeah. Uh, And I'd, uh, I'd, I'd actually like to thank Julia for being yes. a, one, oh. a wonderful host. Thank, thank you. It was a pleasure. Um, that's it. Let's please have a big rousing round of applause for our guests and all the wisdom they've brought today. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.